Mohammed al Sayas went with his family to a beach in Gaza. Unfortunately, the parents didn't realize that sewage was flowing meters away from where they were swimming, and that they were swimming in mostly raw sewage. By evening, Muhammad in particular was not feeling well. And while all the family was vomiting, the parents rushed Muhammad to a nearby hospital. A virus from the sewage had got to Muhammad's brain. Muhammad was dead within 10 days. Just one hour's drive south from here in Tel Aviv, there's a water and sanitation crisis in Gaza. Two million people have run out of water. The aquifer, the groundwater of Gaza, has been overdrawn. And as the groundwater has dropped, seawater is rushing in. In addition, there's very little treatment of sewage in Gaza. The sewage is percolating into the groundwater that people are drinking. At the moment, 97% of the groundwater of Gaza is no longer drinkable. And by the end of this year, all of the water of all the groundwater of Gaza will be polluted. Ladies and gentlemen, nature knows no boundaries. And as the sewage of Gaza, including the sewage that killed Muhammad, flows out, it's carried with the streams north towards Israel. 120 million liters of sewage are today flowing out of Gaza every single day. Last year, the Ashkelon desalination plant, pride technology of Israel, producing 15% of our drinking water, was closed twice because of the sewage of Gaza. This summer, Gaza beaches, Israeli beaches just north of Gaza, were closed because of the sewage. Israel's Iron Dome can knock down Hamas rockets, but the fence around Gaza cannot stop the sewage nor disease. Should pandemic disease break out in Gaza, cholera or typhoid, hundreds of thousands of people will be walking towards the fences of Israel and Egypt. They will not be carrying stones or rockets. They'll be carrying empty buckets, pleading for water. Just 70 kilometers to our east is the River Jordan. It was the only fast-flowing river that we had. In the 1850s, an American admiral by the name of Lynch was the first Westerner to take a boat from the Sea of Galilee down to the Dead Sea. In fact, Lynch took four boats, but he lost one of his boats on the rapids that were then there on the River Jordan. Today, a mouse wheel will hardly turn in what's left of the River Jordan. For legitimate reasons, there's been massive water diversion. The national water carrier of Israel, dams by Syria and Jordan, and the King Abdallah Canal. But a conflict mindset has taken all of the healthy water. And in its place, the sewage of Israeli, Palestinian, and Jordanian communities were flowing. A river holy to half of humanity, where Jesus was baptized for Christianity, where for Jews, miracles took place on its banks, and for Muslims, where four of the companions to the prophet Muhammad were buried, has been turned into little more than an open sewer. The river as the border, fenced and mined, has been turned into the regional dumping ground of the region. 
Here we have some of the highest levels of poverty. On the Jordanian side of the Jordan Valley, there are pockets of 40% unemployment. That translates to 50% youth unemployment. The largest number of volunteers from Jordan who have joined ISIS have come from Jordan Valley communities. There's a link between ecological demise, poverty, underdevelopment, and the growth of radical, dangerous ideologies. Ladies and gentlemen, water security, ours and our neighbors, and national security concerns. How serious can it get? Well, look at Syria, look at Yemen. The civil rising in Syria did not occur just on water, but the failure of the Assad regime to respond to consecutive years of drought meant that farmers were left without water, and hundreds of thousands of them, together with their families, moved to nearby cities that with their anger fueled the civil unrest. In Yemen, where like Gaza, cities a long time ago ran out of water, and like Syria, where war rages, cholera has today broken out. In these last months, 2,000 people have died from cholera. 500,000 Yemenis are infected, and 5,000 people are catching the disease every single day. In the midst of all this turmoil, Israel is a world leader on water. Israel is, in fact, the world leader on treating wastewater and reusing that affluent for agriculture. We're at over 80, 86 percent. In addition, Israelis have been involved in developing membrane technology that's dramatically reduced the cost of manufacturing water from the sea. It's called desalination. In less than a decade, Israel has built five major desalination plants, some of the largest in the world, that today supply 70% of our drinking water. It means that we're less dependent on the natural waters. In fact, along the eastern Mediterranean, there are only two countries that have excess domestic water. Turkey, because of its mountains and rainfall, and Israel, because of its technology. The challenge and question before us is whether Israel's leadership in water can be a game changer that promotes regional water security. In the Oslo Accords of 1995, Israelis and Palestinians were only able to get to an interim water agreement. Water issues and resolving allocation of natural water were seen as too difficult. Because natural water is finite, we're trying to reallocate water between Israelis and Palestinians was seen as leading to winners and losers. And therefore, water issues and a final water agreement was deferred together with other final status issues of Jerusalem, of borders, of settlements, and of refugees to be resolved in a package deal. But today, water is no longer a zero-sum game. Today, we're able to strike a fair water deal between Israelis and Palestinians without any losers, with changes in allocation replaced by desalinated water at reasonable cost. Yet nevertheless, a water deal has still to be struck. One of the great challenges is that the way 
that the negotiations of the peace process have been led. For the past 23 years, negotiations have been led in an all or nothing manner. Either we agree on all five final status issues, including, including water, or we agree on nothing. In that way, resolving water issues that are today easily done so are held hostage to the failure to agree on the more difficult issues, such as Jerusalem. Well, that's not right. And both our governments bear responsibility for holding water hostage in order to try and get a better deal on one of the other final status issues. But we also see from our own self-interest that holding water hostage threatens our own water security. If we're to avoid the tragedy and turmoil of Syria and Yemen developing in Gaza and in the West Bank, then we do need our governments to strike a fair water deal. There is some room for optimism. In the Jordan Valley, we've seen some game changing. A decade ago, a government official said to me, Gidon, you're naive. Water will never flow down the River Jordan again. The region has run out of water. After a moment of silence, the same official said to me, but I do remember going fishing with my father 50 years ago on the banks of the River Jordan. And wouldn't it be remarkable if I could take my son today to fish on the banks of the river as my father had done with me? Well, since 2013, fresh water is flowing out of the Sea of Galilee into the River Jordan. <laughs> no less important, sewage treatment plants have also been built on the Israeli, Palestinian and Jordanian side, removing some of the pollutants, while lots more investment and water is needed down the Jordan. It is clear that the linkage between water, development and security have increasingly been recognized. This is my very favorite photo. While it's technology that increased the water pie, it's leadership that's brought the additional water to the Jordan River. These are mayors, Israeli, Palestinian and Jordanian, coming from the communities along the Jordan River, who for a decade have literally been jumping in to the Jordan River together. They're not best friends, and the conflict continues, but they've come to understand that the only way for them to improve the livelihoods of their communities is literally to get wet together, to cooperate over water. I remain optimistic, and my optimism comes from this leadership, community-level leadership, from mayors and also youth. <laughs> We can be good water neighbours and we can be leaders for the rest of the world on water 
if we work together. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>